If you look at the topic for this evening, you will notice it just says, uh, uh, don't do, but do. Do not, but do. And you might think that it's all about uh, rules taught by men. And actually in the Bible, uh, there are many uh, God-given do's and don'ts, not rules taught by men. Today in the churches all over the world, there are a lot of uh, rules and regulations prescribed by people, uh, their own ideas, their own opinions, rules and regulations in the churches and people don't like following sometimes these rules. But scripture also talks about do's and don'ts. So today I'm going to speak on seven aspects of Christian life, seven don'ts and do's. And uh, since the scripture, we follow it for our own good. Uh, because the entire scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, any uh, do's and don'ts based on scripture, we will do well to follow for our own benefit. Because when you love God, we'll obey his teachings. So what I'm going to share today is straight from scripture and uh, don'ts and do's from scriptures covering different aspects of our lives. I'm going to speak about seven, seven of them. And uh, in the brochure sent to you, the creative sent to you, and also in the announcement, we had mentioned two aspects of Christian life, do's and don'ts. But I'm going to be sharing seven. And we'll do well to take to heart uh, what is there in Scripture. Because when we live by the Scriptures, they're going to be so blessed. In the letter of James, in chapter 1, from verse 22, James writes, Do not merely listen to the word of God and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone listen to the word of God and does not do what it says is like man looks at his face in a mirror, he goes away and forgets what he looks like. But the man looks intently to the perfect law that gives freedom and continues doing it, not forgetting what is heard, he'll be blessed in what he does. The word blessed here is makarios, which means happy. You'll be happy and joyful in a Christian life as we are in the center of the will of God. So let's go straight away into all these different aspects of don'ts and do's. So I'll go to the first one concerning our lives. In the book of Romans, in chapter 6, verse 13, Paul writes, Do not offer the parts of the body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but offer yourselves to God as those brought from death to life, and offer the parts body to him as instruments of righteousness. So first aspect is about our lives, the parts of our body. Early we offered a part of the body to sin, to the world. We did not know the Lord then. Do not do that anymore. Rather, instead of that, offer the parts of body to God as instruments of righteousness. Now we all know that in the book of Romans, in 12th chapter, verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer bodies as living sacrifices. In response to the mercy of God, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices to him, to the Lord. How does one offer the body as a living sacrifice? The body has many parts. And all these parts of body, which we earlier gave to the world, in fact to sin, now we offer to God. And the most uh, uh, well-known parts of body which we earlier offered to the world, to the sin, were our eyes, our ears, our mouths. With our eyes we coveted. With our eyes we uh, lusted after things. With ears we listened to gossip and slander. With the mouth we spoke loose words. And different faculties of our body we earlier offered to the world, which means to sin. Now we specifically have to offer them to God, to be used by God. Instead of lusting and coveting things, we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, fix our eyes on Jesus, study his life, the author and perfecter of our life, of our faith. And we read the scriptures to understand, to meditate and apply scriptures. 
Earlier we heard gossip and slander. Now we hear the word of God. So every part of a body which you early offered to sin, now we offer to God. This is why the apostle Paul, when he had a struggle with sin, he writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? The word rescue there is a word called Ryomai in Greek, which means to deliver. Who will deliver me from this body? Now, we all know that in the Lord's Prayer, this goes like this. One part goes like this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Please not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver means Ryomai. Same word, Ryomai. Evil means porneros. And we know that through the cross, many times I've shared this, through the work of Christ on the cross, we have been delivered from the evil one. We are now in the kingdom of God. And while we live in this kingdom, enjoy this kingdom today, the members of our body, the eyes, the ears, the mouth, and different aspects of our body tend to be attracted to things of this world. The devil enters us as with things of this world and our struggles with the body. And Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body? He does not say, who will rescue me from Satan? He's been rescued already. We are not free. We have been set free. But then we have a problem with the body. But praise God, Paul found the solution for the problem with the body also. This inner man, he delighted in the law of God. Romans 7.22, he says, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. Romans 7.25, and very soon the body also followed when he lived by the spirit. Through the spirit, he put to death the mysteries of his body. But then we must understand that specifically we have to articulate our desire to God. Lord, earlier he offered the members of the body to sin. Now, Lord, you take my eyes, you take my mouth, you take my ears, sanctify me, Lord. Be specific. And therefore, we'll see how God changes completely His work of the Holy Spirit. Number one was that. Number two, the words we speak. The most troublesome part of our body is the tongue. In James chapter 3, verse 1 to 11, James writes about the tongue. The restless evil, full of deadly poison. It corrupts the whole person. His whole is, of course, the body on fire, is set on fire in hell. Man can tame every lang every uh, animal, bird, reptile. No man can tame the tongue. In fact, it goes on to say in third chapter, verse 6 to 8, we we'll read. The tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. A restless evil full of deadly poison. And you begin to wonder if no man can tame the tongue, how can I tame the tongue? Well, we can't tame the tongue, but God can tame the tongue. So specifically offer the tongue to the Lord. Very difficult part of the body to handle. The mouth to speak loose words. So the second don't and do is Philippians, sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29. The Paul writes, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only useful for building up others that benefit those who listen. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of the mouth. But only what is used for building up others, according to this, that they benefit those who listen. So the words we speak should not be words that pull people down. Unwholesome talk, careless talk, scandalous talk, gossip talk, malicious talk, none of that. Rather, instead of doing that, speak words of edification. Building up people, words of grace, it comes from authority. Words of authority, words of grace. When Jesus spoke, they were amazed at his teaching because he spoke words of authority, Luke 4, 32. And he spoke graciously, Luke 4, 22. Gracious words means speaking words that people don't deserve to hear. God speaks to us. We don't deserve what God speaks to us. He always speaks to us to build us up. We don't deserve it. By His grace, He speaks to us. 
in the same way having received grace we call to manifest grace so every word we speak must be building up people never tearing them down always building up people in fact when we speak unwholesome talk we are grieving the holy spirit many people ask this question brother how does a christian grieve the holy spirit always look at the context of every verse that we read in the bible Ephesians 4:30 says do not give the holy spirit of god do not grieve holy spirit of god Ephesians 4:29 the previous verse that's a context when you speak unwholesome talk loose talk people talking against people behind their back backbiting slander then we are grieving the holy spirit because he lives in us and everything that we speak god takes note of third chapter malachi was 16 we read then those who feared the lord spoke to each other the lord listened and heard and the scroll of remembrance was written down matthew 12:36 says we are given account to god for every careless word we have spoken so today you and me are called to be people who speak the very words of god in a godly way gracious words spoken graciously first peter 4:11 peter writes to christians to use a very mere term mere christians not necessarily leaders in the church not necessarily apostles prophets evangelists pastors teachers but you and me just christians children of god to them peter writes first peter 4:11 if anyone speaks he must do one speaking the very words of god that's number 2 okay i have five more to cover the third is the mind do's and don'ts in the mind now when you look at that uh, what the lord told peter god had told the disciples how going to jerusalem they were arrested and crucified and peter says in 16 chapter of matthew verse 22 never lord this shall never happen to you. Lord Jesus was doing the will of the Father. He knew he had to go to Jerusalem. He had to be arrested. He will be and, and crucified. Of course, he will rise from the dead on the third day. All that he told the disciples, they couldn't understand. And Peter says, "Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you." Then the Lord tells Peter, twenty-third verse, "Get behind me, Satan! You are a stumbling block to me." The Lord is addressing. the thought that came to peter on the basis of which he said never lord this shall never happen to you the source of the thought was the evil one the lord addresses satan to peter get behind me satan you are a stumbling block to me anything that comes in the way of the will of god this has to be from satan only he opposes god's ways Jesus knew the basis by which Peter said don't go to Jerusalem it shouldn't happen to you was from the evil one so he speaks to evil one through Peter and then he addresses Peter you don't have in mind the things of god but the things of men in other words you're supposed to have in mind the things of god not the things of men things of men means what worldly thinking now peter telling jesus it shouldn't happen to you lord it was a very normal response of a human being to somebody else whom he loves who says i'm going to go there i'm going to get arrested i'm going to get crucified so no this shouldn't happen to you take care don't no not for you it's a human response a human way of responding but it was coming against the will of god god's will was at that point of time christ having having finished his work had to be crucified so peter had in mind the things of men not the things of god what the lesson we learn lesson we learn is we should not have in mind the things of men rather the things of god now worldly ways and godly ways are different worldly thoughts and godly thoughts are different isaiah chapter 5 chapter 55 Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, we read how God says 
His base is higher than our base. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And therefore, we are living in a world as strangers here. We Christians are strangers in this world. And being strangers in the world, we can't live like the rest of the world. Our old way of thinking has to change. That's why this transformation of our life has been preceded by the renewal of our minds. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul writes to the church in Rome. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Your minds have to be renewed, made new. Ephesians chapter 4, 20 to 20, 24. Paul writes, You were taught to got a former way of life, to put off the old self, which has been corrupted by the civil desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God to righteousness and holiness. So we as Christians today should have in mind the things of God. What God has spoken to us, <coughs> remember. What God has done to us, remember. Psalm 103 verse 2. Forget not his benefits. What is done for you, remember. Revelation chapter 3 verse 3. The church in Sardis, remember what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. So we remember what God spoke to us, what God did to us, and also we remember His will for us today. Keep in mind the things of God. Never let that go out of your mind and your heart. Keeping in mind things of God. Jesus told the disciples in John 4, 34, My food is with the will of Him who sent me and finished His work. My food do the will of him who sent me and finished his work. So let's examine our minds. When you have time to think about it, let's think about what we think. Sounds funny, isn't it? Let's think about what we think. It's like this. Whenever you have, your mind is free to think what you want to think. What do you think about? Are those thoughts pleasing to God? We are called to please God in our thinking. In Psalm 94, verse 11, it's written, For God knows the thoughts of man, and man's thoughts without God are futile. But when we have in mind the things of God, take to heart what God speaks to us, and accept in the mind what God speaks to heart, then the mind will be clean. Having in mind the things of God, and not the things of men, will make a mind clean. In fact, we have the word of God in our minds and hearts, the mind and the heart will become clean. Because God's word is a cleansing agent. It sanctifies. John 17, 17, the Lord told the Father in heaven, and he prayed, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. Your word sanctifies. In John 15, 3, the Lord told the disciples, the apostles actually, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So always keep in mind the things of God. And I normally give two examples. One, not to follow, other to follow in the context of our thinking. Having in mind things of God, not the things of men. Now, in Micah chapter 2, verse 1, the scripture talks about People, Micah writes, Woe to those who plan iniquity, who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it's in the power to do it. On the bed, lying down at night, about to sleep, mind is free. Day's work is over. You can think what you want to think. You free to think what you want to think. What do you think about then? These people think about planning, how to plan iniquity. They plot evil on their beds, nighttime. Next day, they go and do it. Because it's the power to do it. God has given us a free will. Today we can choose to obey God or disobey God. 
So night time, what do we think about? As compared to these people, look at Psalm 63, verse 6. David writes, Psalm 63, verse 6. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. In my bed, I remember you. So we must keep in mind things of God, not the things of men. Do not have in mind things of men, but have in mind the things of God. That's number three. Number four is through the spirit and wine. Wine and spirit. Ephesians 5.18 Do not be drunk with wine. Is your debauchery? Instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. It is debauchery. Rather be filled with the Spirit. It's very, isn't it very interesting to know when you go to you know, a supermarket where they have all kinds of uh, products. There's one area called spirits. Wines and spirits. Because liquor is referred to as a spirit. Wines and spirits. Isn't it very ironic? A different kind of spirit. When you keep on having too much of drinks, you're in a different mood. And some spirits take over. From the occult world, they take over. In fact, debauchery actually means sexual immorality. immorality. So, being filled with wine leads to immorality. If you look at the look book of Proverbs, 23rd chapter, from verse 31. Do not gaze at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup. When it goes down smoothly, in the end it will bite like a snake and poison like a viper. Don't gaze at wine. The same said, don't drink wine. Don't gaze. When you gaze at wine, looks very attractive in a nice wine glass, a crimson color, goes well with your dress. You think you sip one, second time, third time, fourth time, or sometimes on the floor. So when you're drunk with wine, it leads to debauchery. Drunkenness is one of the sins. Identified along with so many others, the fifth chapter of Galatians, verse 19 to 21, acts of the sinful nature. So drunkenness most definitely displeases God. Of course, Paul that does tell Timothy, advise Timothy in 1 Timothy 6:23, don't just drink water, drink a little wine because of your stomach and fecal ailments. So drinking wine or uh, grape juice. Fermented drink also, a little bit fermented drink also. For health is fine. So that particular verse for stomach ailments, they used to go and pour, advise Timothy, don't just drink water. Timothy didn't drink wine properly, only drank water. So take a little wine for your stomach problems. Because of that particular verse, there are some Christians who have stomach problems every day. Oh, Timothy, I have stomach problems. So let's be honest about it. Why are we drinking? And Paul said, don't be drunk with wine. Rather, be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're full of wine, when you drink too much of wine, you're filled with wine and you do at least all kinds of sins. Instead of being filled with wine, what does Paul say? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit here is capitalist. Now, when you accept Christ as Savior and Lord, we have the Holy Spirit living inside us. He comes and dwells in us. We are the deposit of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.14 In the same letter to people who have the Holy Spirit living inside them, Paul writes, don't be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be complacent about the deposit you have of the Spirit in you. Ask God, to, Jesus, to anoint you. So it is Jesus who anoints us with the Holy Spirit. And believe me, I have the experience of both. Having drunk with wine before I became a believer and also being filled with Spirit. I know the difference. What an amazing difference it is. Because once you are filled with the Spirit of God, you have no taste for these things. You cannot enjoy sin. Leave alone drunkenness. You know, when I used to be, drink a lot those days, I would not be drunk in the normal sense. The only symptoms I had of drunkenness was I thought the light had become dim in the room. Bright light, but I think it's dim. 
And I used to just pull around, I used to mimicry, imitate my bosses, all kinds of things. Then God told me, no, when I became a believer, he said, no, you can't do this. I asked God, Lord, uh, I was a new believer, did not know the Bible at all. I asked, Lord, Lord, I drink once in a way, not very often, once in a way I drink. Is it wrong to drink? Uh, then Lord said, what do you do when you drink? I told him, Lord, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do that. I told God, I do not do. The Lord very clearly told me, don't do what you do not do. What do you do? I do mimicry with coarse joking. Mimicry which is not good. And would I do it? Lord asked me. No, I won't do it, Lord. Then stop. So I stop drinking completely. And as filled with the Holy Spirit today, Praise God for that. And such a joy to know we can move in that power. In that power. So, very simple. Don't be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's number four. Number five is to do with the occult world. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11, Paul writes, Have nothing to do with the proof of the deeds of darkness. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, rather expose them. Don't anymore involved in the deeds of darkness. Rather now expose them. When not in the Lord, we are in darkness. We are following the world, we are in darkness. And many of us, like me, we are in real darkness. We are in the uh, different spiritual world, not of God but of other, other spirits. And now having come to believe in the Lord, as the Lord leads us, not only we should not go back to the old life, he must expose these things. For people who are caught up in that, who are blinded. He says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He has blinded the minds of unbelievers. The God of this age, that's the evil one, the prince of this world. And having come out of that darkness, we are called to share the gospel and the gospel liberates people. So exposing darkness basically means what? Bringing light. Where there's light, there's no darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness isn't doesn't exist by itself. It's the absence of light. And the light comes in, darkness goes. So in the spiritual context, the works of darkness are the work of the occult world, Satan and his angels, who are working among people, who are holding the whole world in ransom, holding them in bondage. And in the Old Testament talks about various occult practices. Book of Deuteronomy 18, chapter 10 and 11. In fact, the Lord warned the Israelites when, when they entered the land of Canaan not to indulge the practices that the nations there indulge in. The seven nations of Canaan. And the Lord tells them, Book of Deuteronomy 18, chapter 10 and 11, Let no one be found among you of a son and daughter in the fire who practice divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, who cast spells, who is a medium, spirit is a concept of the dead. Seven things there, seven occult practices. Now having, maybe we are not involved in those things, but we know about these things. The Bible talks about these things as evil. They are an abomination before God, detestable to God. Contacting, contacting those who are dead is detestable to God. And you know people who do that, Christians do that. They contact people who are dead and try to have interaction with them. And Bible says it's detestable to God. And therefore, have, we may not have done it before, but since the Bible exposes these things as occult, works of darkness, we are called to expose darkness by bringing light, light of God's word. So one thing is to come out of it. Other is, as led by the Holy Spirit, with the wisdom of God, to go and tell people who are caught up in these things, that when they turn to Jesus, we are called to live for Jesus. We not only have eternal life, we have abundant life in this world. You must turn from all these things and expose them. Look what happened in Ephesus. 
when Paul went there, miracles happened there. And uh, handcuffs in Egypt, were, uh, handcuffs in April, they were touched Paul. They were taken to sick people. Evil spirits left them. And great miracles happened. And the Bible talks about seven sons of a Jewish priest called Skeva, they to die about demons. They tell the demons, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Demons said to those seven sons, Jesus I know, Paul I know about, who are you? They came out of that uh, person and O power, the seven sons, they came out naked and bleeding. When this became known in Ephesus, all the people who practiced sorcery, they burned the scrolls. Early they practiced sorcery and witchcraft. And now when they understood that this Christian life is serious business, they burned the scrolls. They openly confessed the evil deeds. Burning scrolls means not going back to the whole life again. Turning from it, repenting. And when this happened there, the name of Jesus was held in high honor in Ephesus. And Acts 19, chapter verse 20 says, in this way, the word of God spread widely and grew in power. Grew in power. When the repenter and they exposed these deeds, they stopped doing it. And, I, and today, can you can imagine 2,000 years later, what happened there is exposed today. There are all the sorceries and scrolls which are destroyed. No question of going back. They belong to the evil one. Sorcery, witchcraft, casting spells, divination, medium spiritus, divination, consulting the dead. We have to expose these things as led by the spirit. So one thing is to come out of it. No more anything to do with it. And all those who are maybe dead and all that, as the Lord leads us, they call to expose it to people who are searching for deliverance. People who are in darkness for searching for light. So Ephesians 5.11 I don't think the fruit of the deeds of darkness rather expose them. Do not go back there. Rather now go expose it. That's number five. Number six. First Peter chapter 3 14-15 Peter writes to the Christians do not fear what they fear and don't be afraid. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Do not, but do. Do not what? Do not fear what they fear. Don't be afraid. But set apart Christ as Lord. Look at the amazing connection. When Christ is Lord of your hearts, you won't have fear. Interestingly, this particular verse, 1 Peter 3, 14, is a quotation from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we find the prophet Isaiah was prophesying around uh, 720 BC. And uh, around him, there were people who were having fears of the future. And even Isaiah had some fears. So in the 8th chapter of uh, uh, Isaiah, verse 11 and 12, Isaiah writes, The Lord spoke to me with a strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the ways of the people. Don't call conspiracy what they call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Who's speaking? God. To whom? To Isaiah. Why? Isaiah was having fears like everybody else around him. Don't fear what they fear. What were they fearing? They were fearing the future. When people fear the future, what do they do? They want to find out the future. They go to astrologers, medium spiritists, try to find out because they're worried. What will happen? What will happen? I want to know. Find out. Find out. People who worry about the future generally want to find out the future. Given a chance, they want to know the future so that they can have their fears rested. So God spoke to Isaiah and says, don't fear what they fear. They are fearing the future. How do they fear in the future? Look at 1920 verse. Isaiah chapter 8, 1920. When men tell you to consult Miriam and Spiritus, to whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God 
Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and the testimony. They don't speak according to this word. They have no light of dawn. In those days when they are having fears and anxieties, by the way, they had very many things common to what we are very familiar with this in our country today. There was astrology. There was there were superstitions. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 6. There was astrology. Isaiah 44, 24, 26. Paul, the Lord spoke to them about not indulging in looking at the stars. There was idol worship around that time, all interlinked. Idol worship, astrology, superstitions. And these people who worried about the future went to medium spirits to find out the future. The Lord says, why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and the testimony of the law. What's the testimony of the law? What the law of God testified to? The whole Old Testament testifies to a person. The law and the prophets. Every prophet spoke about Jesus being forgiveness for sins, his blood. Calling upon his name means forgiveness. Acts 10, 43. The law testifies to Jesus. When he entered the world, Lord Jesus Christ, he told the Jews in John chapter 5, Verse 44, verse 45, I think. You diligently, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, John 5, 39. You diligently study scriptures. You diligently study scriptures because you think by them you have eternal life. These scriptures testify about me. If you refuse to come to me to have life, these scriptures testify about me. You refuse to come to me to have life. Scriptures testify to Jesus. So, Old Testament time, if they're having fear of the future, the Lord says, don't go to the medium spirits. Why can't the dead have the living? Go the testimony of the law, that is the coming Christ. So, before Christ entered the world, when they had fears, they were called to, they were, they were motivated to call upon the coming Christ for deliverance from fear. Of the future. Look at David. Psalm 34 verse 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me. Delivering from all my fears. And the Lord David called upon was actually the Christ. We know that from book of Matthew. 22nd chapter 41 to 44. The coming Christ. So in those days they were called to call upon Jesus in the context of fear. Now Christ has come. And Peter is quoting the same verse that God told Isaiah. Don't fear what they fear. And today, Christ has come. So, what does he say? Don't fear what they fear. Don't be afraid. But set apart Christ as Lord. He's already come. He's given you salvation. He's given you abundant life when you live for him. And therefore, when he's Lord of your life, there is no fear. Because we know God is for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. There's a direct, direct, direct connection between having Christ as Lord of your life. Every aspect of your life, you should be Lord. 24 hours. Spiritual life, home life, social life, official life, professional life, everywhere Lord. Then you know we're living for him totally, completely, sold out to him. In fact, he bought us by his blood. He actually sold out to him. He bought, he bought us by his blood. No? We live for him. What happens? There's no fear. We live a life free of fear today. So therefore, the key to not having fear is actually Christ being Lord. And when you know him as Lord, you want to know him more and more. As you know him more and more, what happens? His love will come into our hearts. When his love comes in, something goes out. What goes out? Fear goes out. There's no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. 1 John 4, 18. So number six is, don't fear, rather be, let Christ be Lord of your life. Number seven, the last point on don'ts and do's is based on book of Proverbs, 26 chapter 4 and 5. 
Don't answer a fool according to his folly, or you be like him yourself. Don't answer a fool according to his folly, or you be like him yourself. Next verse, fifth verse. Answer a fool according to his folly. Otherwise, it'll be wise with own eyes. Verse four says, "Don't." Verse five says, "Do." So here it talks about answering. Answering whom? Answering fools. One fool you don't answer. Other fool you answer. How do you differentiate which fool this is? Look at verse four. Don't answer fool according to his folly, or you be like him yourself. If someone speaks to you very foolishly, lose words. Or you're useless. You fit for nothing. You're nobody in this world. We tell you that you get irritated sometimes. What do you you might say, for example, the same way, you're also a fool. You're also useless. You fit for nothing. You can't do anything in life. You're nobody. If we speak the same way to him, what's the difference? There's no difference. You are like him yourself. He speaks foolishly. You also speak foolishly. The God's word says, "Don't answer it." When they try to insult you and provoke you, wisdom will teach us to keep quiet. Opposite of foolishness is wisdom, isn't it? The book of Proverbs, nineteen chapter verse eleven. Proverbs nineteen eleven. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is bold to overlook an offense. When someone speaks foolishly to you, foolishly to you, stupid words, putting you down. God's wisdom will teach you to overlook the offense. Keep quiet. Don't answer. Don't answer the same way. If you answer the same way, you are like him yourself. What's the difference? No difference. Then verse five. Then it says you have to answer. Answer it for according to his folly. Otherwise, he'll be wise and nice. It's a different kind of fool. This is the kind of fool the Bible describes as atheist. Or Psalm fifty-three, verse one. The fool says in heart, "There's no God." The fool says in heart, "There's no God." The Bible says, "I'm not saying. I'm only quoting the Bible." The scripture refers to atheists who don't believe in God as fools. Our Bible says, "I'm not saying. I'm only quoting the Bible." So when an atheist comes to you and puts a question to you, and you have to give an answer, then you have to give an answer. Because if you don't give an answer, then what will he say? Oh, this guy is Christian. Don't even think. I put a question he could not answer. So he'll be wise in own eyes. He thinks very, very wise. Of course, I do believe that we must go by the sincerity of the person. How oh, sincere he is, and therefore, when the person is sincere, then answer from the scriptures because only scriptures can really convict people. The Holy Spirit uses scripture to convict people for them to know when they are wrong. So again, don't then do. Don't answer a person who speaks foolishly the same way. But a person is sincere to want to know, and is putting question to you. Even if it's not sincere, be my wise, no nice. Answer it. So seven areas of don'ts and do's. Number one, with regard to our body. Romans six thirteen. Number two, with regard to our mind. Sorry, with regard to our uh, speech. Ephesians four twenty nine. Number three, our mind. Matthew sixteen twenty three. Number four, the spirit. Wine and spirit. Ephesians five eighteen. Number five, works of darkness. Ephesians five eleven. Number six, fear and Christ being Lord. First Peter three fourteen fifteen. And number six, answering fools. There are six seven areas I told you. Don'ts and do's. They are from Scripture, not man made rules. But God-given instructions, we will do well to follow it. And tomorrow, I would like you to go to this message and think about it, absorb it, make it part of your life. Let's.